Over the years, Scranton, Pennsylvania has gone through many changes. From the early days when coal was king to the successful vaudeville era, Scranton has barely stayed the same for even an instant. Some things, however, have remained static fixtures in this ever-changing landscape. Every building has a story. So come along as we investigate the history of the Scranton State School for the Deaf, currently Marywood University's South Campus. For over 125 years, this facility watched over the Green Ridge section of Scranton, a haven for those who could not go anywhere else, and now lies at rest, abandoned, waiting for someone to come along and discover what sets this series of nine buildings apart from the rest of the area. In this documentary, we'll explore the past, present, and future of this beautiful campus. Here I am on the corner of Jefferson Ave and Electric Street. Behind me, the Scranton State School for the Deaf. For 125 years, this building was a safe haven for deaf and hard of hearing students. At a time, there were probably about 89 deaf people throughout Lackawanna County. In 1882, the, the first building was built, and the school opened in 1884. Mary Ann Moran Savakinas, a historian at the Scranton Historical Society, talked with us about the founder of the Scranton School for the Deaf. Basically, the first 20 years of their existence, they really grew. Um, the Pennsylvania Coal Company donated land in the Green Ridge section on Washington and Electric, and that's, um, Emma Garrett was noted as the person to shovel the first bit of dirt at the groundbreaking. Um, and then they built their first building and added, by the end, I think, nine buildings. With the opening of the new school, there were many decisions to be made, such as how the students were going to be taught. Then there were some shifts in the thinking. He, he was a big proponent of sign language, um, but there was also a, a movement for articulation. Maureen Vitti, a former employee of the Death School, worked throughout the period when this teaching practice struggle was taking place. Um, I remember when I started at the school, part of the whole education process, we learned um, when it was thought that the oral approach was the best approach, then it went to the Rochester method and finger spelling, and then it was uh, more of a pigeon signed English total communication. And in the last 10 years we were there, the deaf community in particular was um, a very pro ASL American Sign Language. ASL, American Sign Language, is, is its own language. It has its own sentence structure. Um, typically, uh, there's no spoken language that goes with it. It's a very visual language, um, and it, it's, like I said, it's got its own sentence structure. So you can't put it word for word for word, whereas total communication is word for word for word. It's, I think, harder for a deaf child to understand, but it's easier for a hearing person. After 1970, the school's name was changed to the Scranton School for the Deaf. The high school was added to the campus, changing what was once an empty lot into a nine-building campus. It really evolved into a, an excellent educational facility to give students the tools they needed to move forward to successful lives. One in particular came to us, and she had very little, she had almost no language because she had gone to an oral program. She, I think she had attention issues. And so her behavior, I mean, obviously sitting in class for six hours when you're not understanding anything can get pretty boring. So she would misbehave. With her. We did a behavior program, and I was in, down at the end of the day, every day at 2.30. And if she was good, I'd take her out with me. If she wasn't, we'd try and stretch it out and see if she could, you know, stay in the classroom a little bit longer. And by the end, it, it took a good uh, four or five months, but she improved tremendously. She was such a wonderful success story. The success stories were plenty, but then the impossible happened. It was the drastic cut in funding, I believe, in 2009 that really led to the school's demise and need to... The school was closed in 2009. There was much worry about the future of Scranton's deaf community. The school continued to sit vacant. Um, communication tends to take longer. Meetings take longer. Um, especially if you have to bring in an interpreter, you have deaf staff that are there, 
and all of the staff in the school can sign, but many of the parents couldn't. So when you would bring in an interpreter for a meeting, if you brought in an outside agency, and we had contact obviously with these counseling centers, with juvenile facilities, juvenile uh, maybe probation officers. So whenever there was outside meetings, um, communication was always, it, it took longer. It really led to the school's demise and need to, to recreate itself with the move to Clark Summit. This location closed in 2009. Let's go check out their new location. The school's new location is in Clark Summit. It is only a short distance from the old location. I'm now standing at the gates to the new deaf school. Located in Clark Summit, this school now houses all of the students that were formerly at the school in Scranton. The new school location is more accessible and helpful to students than ever before. As for the old school, it was acquired by Marywood for $500,000 with a $2 million value. Rumors of asbestos and lead paint have circulated, but without any proof. So now that we know what did happen here, the better question is, what will happen? According to an official spokesperson for the university, quote, at this time, the administration does not feel it necessary to discuss the acquisition or future plans for this facility. So what's gonna happen to this facility? Well, that's all up in the air. Thank you.